Listening in here inside of a Michigan courtroom today is the second day of the Miller hearing for the Oxford High School shooter as a judge will decide whether the then 15 year old will spend the rest of his life in prison for the Oxford High School shooting. We're being joined live now by Fox 2's Charlie Langton, who is joining us here on live now from Fox. Charlie, thanks for being here with us. Tell us a little bit more about what happened in court today. I understand there was a lot of emotional testimony. Yeah, I tell you what, in a day that we really thought the defense, the shooter was going to present a case, and the shooter did present a case, but I tell you what, the clearly the witnesses for the prosecution really dominated the proceedings today. And a couple of them, they were actually students and an assistant principal that were actually there on the day of the shooting and did their best to try to save their, their fellow students. I mean, I, I tell you, it was just the emotional testimony because they described exactly, uh, let me just get this thing here. They described exactly uh, what was going on, the fact that they were hearing uh, the shots, the fact that they were in a, a bathroom stall, uh, that they were out, one of them tried to make a run for it. I thought this was the end of it. An assistant principal that literally just broke down. She was shaking him, and, and pretty much everyone in the courtroom was just, I mean, filled with emotion. Okay, so that was from the prosecution side. Now, the defense basically took its turn saying essentially that there's two issues there. They believe that the shooter can, uh, can be uh, rehabilitated. And there was an expert witness that testified basically saying that the minor, the 15-year-old's brain was not fully developed. Now, we're not going to mention the shooter by name. We did that in other reports, but we're not doing it today. That was a request made by the prosecutor as well as the victims, and we just made a decision to honor that. One of the reasons was is that yesterday's testimony came out that the shooter wanted the notoriety, and that was one of the reasons why he did that. So uh, we're going to honor the request not to, not to mention that name. But take a look at this. When the shooter entered the courtroom today, he basically was in chains. Uh, he was basically... Uh, uh, had no expression on his face and showed little emotion. Here's a little bit of the testimony today. Would he be um, participating in any sort of like anger management or cognitive yes. behavior programming? Yes, uh, there is anger management and that is actually a program. They have a couple of different versions of it, but certainly that's something he would be referred to. Cognitive uh, behavioral uh, programs to uh, they are there CBT kind of behavior therapy uh, where he's able to examine his behavior and his thoughts what got him into that behavior to begin with given that adolescents in general are already compromised with respect to their prefrontal cortical development uh, this then makes it further difficult it is using resources that would be uh, so when embarked on a, on a uh, problematic impetuous impulsive otherwise ill-suited uh, plan, a lot of that prefrontal resource is being used to carry out the plan. Are you aware the defendant took a gun and strode up to a girl sitting against a locker who would have her head covered, put the gun right to her head and execute her? Were you aware of that? Uh, no, I was not. So here's what's kind of going on here. We heard from two expert witnesses, one an expert in basically adolescent brain development and the other one uh, an expert in rehabilitation. The judge is going to have to do in any of these Miller uh, cases, at any of these Miller hearings throughout the entire country, it's not just here in Michigan, but the Supreme Court said back uh, in 2012 that any minor who's convicted of first degree murder or the equivalent life in prison without parole gets to have this hearing. And the issue really is a balancing test for the judge to make sure that uh, you could get life in prison or are there mitigating factors that would suggest that this particular defendant can be rehabilitated and he may not have understood the crime. There are some other factors, Miller factors as we're calling them now, his, his upbringing, and that's why you heard earlier before, before, before I started, uh, all of the text messages that, that the shooter was reaching out to his mother and the mother was not answering him. Uh, the shooter was saying that he's got problems, he's got issues, and no one seemed to care. He also had a friend for many, many years that they basically stayed up all night texting back and forth, back and forth, which shows that he is capable
capable of having some love, having some friendship, having something, but then that particular friend moved away. And so uh, the shooter was left with, with nobody. There was testimony yesterday, his dog died. So there was clearly depression going on. There were demons going on. And he said that he thought that the schools were just brainwashing him and he wanted to make a name for himself. And he wanted to be known for doing something that would get the news of the country, basically. It's pretty much what he texted. And we talked about this yesterday, the fact that he made Google searches to figure out, does Michigan have the death penalty? It doesn't. And then what would be the maximum crime that he could get in Michigan if he went out and shot people in the school? In this case, it's not automatic life in prison. It could be, but it's not automatic. So that's basically the, the, the prosecutor, prosecutor is countering the defense expert witness saying, judge, you've got to balance the, the, the heinousness of this crime. And what they did today was they had students testify that basically tried to help their fellow students, uh, hearing the shots, et cetera. And again, very, very emotional testimony. So what this judge is gonna do now is gonna, uh, we have to be back on Tuesday. There's at least one more witness, probably closing arguments, and then the judge uh, will uh, write an opinion. Uh, very interesting though, how the defense really uh, took a look at the, the two main the witnesses. There are actually three, but the two main witnesses. One of them, the rehabilitation uh, expert, basically admitted under cross-examination that all convicted felons, whether you're an adult or a juvenile, will get rehabilitation in prison. So what makes this particular minor any different? I'm not so sure that really came out. Again, editorializing, but it was the subject of cross-examination here. And then the other expert witness, the one that talked about the brain development, he admitted in cross-examination that he didn't even talk to the shooter didn't review any records in the case, that his testimony was based on a general knowledge in his research and that of his peers that the brain of an adolescence, an adolescent is just not developed. Whether that will be strong enough, how much weight the judge will give that element uh, to one of the five Miller factors remains to be seen. So bottom line is we come back on Tuesday, hopefully the case will wrap up and then the judge will uh, give a formal opinion as to, the, uh, as to uh, how many years or life without prison, without parole rather, and then there'll be a formal sentencing when all the victims, of which there were many in the courtroom today, will be able to say one last uh, thing uh, about this particular shooter. I'm live out in front of the courthouse now. I'll send it back to you. Yeah, Charlie, thanks so much for that update. Great reporting as always. You mentioned the shooter's mom in this. I know his parents, too, were facing some legal troubles throughout this as well. What's the latest with his parents? Yeah, good update on that one. I actually had a chance to talk to uh, the, uh, one of the attorneys that represents one of the parents. Uh, that case is actually in the Supreme Court right now. We were going to have a trial in February, but that's been put on hold because uh, it, these, the Michigan Supreme Court has to make a ruling as to whether or not parents can be criminally responsible for the shooting, the murder of their son. That's a legal issue. The lower courts basically have said yes, but the Supreme Court now is going to hear this case and decide whether or not this case should have even been bound over, whether or not the manslaughter charges against the two parents is even a crime. Interesting legal issue. Uh, and it's gone back and forth between our appellate court and then our Michigan Supreme Court, uh, how that will shake out. Uh, but what it, the bottom line to that one is that everything is on hold right now as far as the parents. I do suspect though that we will get a trial probably early part of next year. The parents are still incarcerated, actually right over here in the Oakland County uh, Jail. Uh, they have been pretty much incarcerated uh, since about a couple of weeks or so after this crime, which happened back in November of 2021. So uh, whether or not, th that'll be a whole new hearing. And based on what we saw today, I would expect a lot, again, of emotional testimony uh, that will come out in that trial. That's a jury trial, by the way, and the initial uh, question for the jury is whether or not uh, the, the parents should be criminally responsible for the criminal acts of their son. Interesting legal argument there. Yeah, certainly. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for that update live from Michigan. We appreciate it here, and I'm sure we'll be talking again next week as this continues on. You got it. Thank you. All right, Fox 2's Charlie Langton reporting there, giving us an update on, on the latest in this Oxford 
school shooter hearing that happened today. We heard a little bit of uh, what happened inside of the courtroom, both before we talked with Charlie and then during his report there playing out part of it. We want to play out just a little bit more for you here in case you missed it earlier. A lot of emotional testimony hearing from people who were inside of the school on that tragic, heinous day that all of this occurred. So let's play out a little bit more of this for you next here from the courtroom today. An agent in charge at a halfway house for offenders being released from prison. They were actually released on prison status and they were uh, stayed there for roughly a year or two while they found employment and maintained their family ties and then they were finally released on the parole. And part of that, after that, I went to work with the Genesee County Probation Office, where I was a probation officer, and I did that uh, for a few years. And then I went back to the correction center as agent in charge, excuse me, as a supervisor, and then later as a manager of both the uh, uh, halfway house and the uh, parole office in Genesee County. And what um, positions have you held as a deputy or a warden? Okay. Yes, uh, I began working as a deputy warden at the uh, Hiawatha Correctional Facility up in the Upper Peninsula. And uh, I worked there for roughly <coughs> two years and I transferred over to the Kinross Correctional Facility. And uh, this was from 93 through just about the year 2000, 2001. And after eight years in the Upper Peninsula, I transferred back down the state, uh, just a short period of time at Detroit, and then over to the Huron Men's Facility, which was in Ypsilanti. And since that time, I've worked at uh, numerous different facilities throughout the state, uh, probably eight different uh, correction facilities. And in your positions as deputy warden or warden, have you been involved in the management of prisoners who are referred to as juvenile lifers? Yes, I have. And do you have any sort of teaching experience? Yes, I did. I taught with uh, Siena Heights College. And what did you teach? I taught corrections, introduction to corrections. And did you also teach with the University of Detroit? Yes, prior to that I taught corrections also from the University of Detroit. Now have you ever testified in a courtroom before? Yes. And have you ever been qualified as a witness? Or, yes. I'm sorry, an expert? <laughs> yes, I have. And can you tell us where you've been qualified as an expert? Uh, this would have been out of Kent County, Judge uh, Trusox Court. And how many times have you been qualified as an expert? Twice. And the third time it was uh, not necessary. So the two And those two times were both in Kent County? Uh, yes. And would those have been both times involving cases where the issue was whether to sentence someone as a, a juvenile to life in prison without parole? Actually, these were the after the fact. These were offenders that had actually been incarcerated for a lengthy period of time as juvenile lifers and were looking at possible sentence reductions under the JWLOP. Now, is there a certain um, theory or method methodology you use for evaluating cases involving life without parole sentences? Generally I look at their entire record from the time they come into the system uh, up to the time they're doing the report. And I look at their misconduct history, what, what they've done since they were in prison. I look at what programs they're involved in, uh, which of the core programs they completed for the Department of Corrections, uh, what their education was, whether or not they completed their uh, high school education while they're in prison. Um, looked at their employment. Did they maintain employment while they're in prison? Your Honor, at this time I'd like to qualify Dr. Romanowski as an expert in corrections. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. This witness will be reflected as an expert in the area of corrections. You may proceed. Now, Dr. Romanowski, this case is a little different, correct? That is correct. And could you describe how it's different? Well, it's different in that the Miller hearing is being held before the person is sentenced, where the other ones I've worked with, and I've done reports, and I have several that are pending, probably about a dozen have all been with the offender being, uh, having his Miller hearing after he was sentenced instead of prior. And just kind of briefly, that's because Miller brought about a change in the law, correct? Correct. 
And so people that had been sentenced as juveniles to life without parole then had the opportunity to be released, correct? Correct. And in your work, are you familiar with the Miller factors? Yes, for the most part. In particular, you're familiar with the one involving rehabilitation, would that be true? Yes, potential for rehabilitation and maturity or immaturity of the offender. Have you reviewed any sort of documents regarding Ethan Crumbly? Yes, I have. And what types of documents have you reviewed? For the most part, the documents I reviewed were his jail records. And is it customary for you to consider those types of records in your role as a witness? Generally, when I'm considering those records, it's in addition to the Department of Corrections records. But in this case, all I had were the records from Oakland County Jail. And have you ever met or interviewed Ethan Crumbly? No, I have not. And you don't know information as to some of the factors, for example, his home life or family environment, correct? Only from what I read in the news. Thank you. Now, did you repair, prepare a report in this matter? Yes, I did. Your Honor, it's exhibit number J for the record. And do you have a copy of that report with you? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, Ethan is a juvenile placed in the county jail here in Oakland County, correct? Correct. What does that mean for him? Well, what that means for him is uh, obviously he's being considered as an adult for sentencing, and you know, that, that is part of it, but it's also the fact that, uh, or the charges, I'm sorry, but it's also due to the fact that he is a juvenile in an adult facility, so he has to main, be maintained um, under strict observation at all times. He has to be kept from any person over the age of 18. And part of this is the PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act requirements. And we've heard um, with respect to Ethan the phrase out of sight and sound. Can you explain what that means? Uh, what that basically means is that you have to remain out of sight and sound of an adult offender. All right, listening in here to some testimony from earlier today, 